I'm happy to be here. Well, the Great Reset uh, is actually a, an intellectual movement to which I subsigned, which was initiated by Klaus Schwab. You may have heard about Klaus Schwab earlier, the founder of the World Economic Forum. And uh, my view is he does take the issue of new normal serious. And we really have to get that straight, what it means new normal. New normal in Klaus' view and my view as well is really understand that we cannot continue the way we did and we will not and never return to the way we did. We have to, think, uh, to do things anew. We need to innovate and two elements of the innovation are already clear by now, though much is uh, still open to develop and we need to be open. But one thing is clear, we need healthy cities. And uh, I will deal with the issue of healthy cities, which is not really addressed in his book, which I appreciate and recommend to all of you, the, the blue book on the Great Reset of Klaus. But it doesn't deal with healthy cities. And we need also to rethink and reevaluate uh, how we are dealing with inequalities in the cities and in the world, in fact. Not because we are moral people, I, I hope we are, we are moral people, but we have to do it to avoid risks that we face up to systemic risks. Uh, so the system is at risk if we don't uh, reevaluate our way to treat inequalities in the world. Yeah, I'm also a part of this uh, International Urban Climate Change Research Network. It's a network of the Columbia University and they are working on regular assessment reports of the future of cities. And there are actually some Japanese partner as actually a hub in Tokyo from the UCCRN. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 15 minutes is, is, is really sportive to, to deal with such an issue. We are in a pandemic and uh, we have learned a lot uh, and probably nobody have expected what we have seen. We, we with, within a few months we run into the deepest economic crisis in industrial history. It's much deeper than the, than the depression of the 20s uh, and even, uh, of course, much deeper than the financial crisis was. And we, we were scared of them, and we should think that this is the scale we are talking about. If this continues what we saw in the first two quarters of an economic decline uh, of two, up to 20 to 30% in, uh, in G70 countries, according to o OECD, for a longer term period, we have, uh, um, let's say, three times as much as uh, social troubles as we have seen ever in our industrial history. So that probably gives you an idea on the scale we are talking about. And we all know that this kind of terrifying scenarios uh, that, that are out there urge some politicians to uh, open up quickly to the economic recovery. And at first sight, we, we, as, we seem to be before a tragic choice between public health and public wealth, between saving lives and saving the economy. It was Paul Krugman, a Nobel laureate of economics from 2008, who has sharply rejected the underlying premises of this idea of tragic choice we are, we are in front of. Infected workers and entrepreneurs, of course, cannot save an economy any more than fearful consumers can. And we saw even in the periods of opening up, consumers were hesitating to buy in, in a way that they did before. So without an end to the health crisis, there can be no end to the economic crisis. That's what uh, Krugman said, and I fully subsigned to the view, simply closing the eyes to the pandemic dangers will not lead out of the economic crisis. Only a coordinated strategy to combat the pandemic and recover the economy can. 
the priority must be on health, very clearly. Economic stimuli, my field, in fact, I'm working on this. Uh, I'm an economist by background, and I'm working for my institute on uh, economic stimulus programs currently, are secondary in some sense, but nevertheless, they are important, and they offer an opportunity for change, and uh, mainly a change, as Hubertus already pointed out, towards uh, a transformation into an inclusive and green urban economy. That's my view. And this is what I'm going to bring to you. Um, I'm talking, as I said, mainly with regard to the, the challenges to cities because they hadn't been addressed in Klaus' book. And, um, well, as I said, starting with the key issue of how to deal in future with inequalities, which, we, which came so clearly to our view through the pandemic and what kind of perspectives this has towards urban development. Uh, talking about the local governance structures and how to strengthen them to face, to, to, to face the, the challenges of uh, the pandemic or the new normal. And of course the crucial question is grey or green recovery, at least in the long term, and uh, the EU Green Deal and also the EU recovery program called Next Generation uh, can be seen as a role model, but they have limits and some weaknesses as well as I will shortly explain. With an estimated 90% of all reported COVID cases, urban areas are the epicenters of the COVID pandemic. This is actually a chart from the US uh, showing you the spikes of cases uh, in, in this uh, country. And um, what you, uh, to just go, as I see you're going straight to the graph, the graph uh, just, uh, well, gives you an idea and doesn't surprise you with regard to the spiking cases in the, in the uh, Northwest, that means New York. Everybody saw the pictures of New York and the way it was dealt with. But if you look down to Florida, which is the second largest affected uh, state of the U United States, it's the plains that were affected most, not exactly the most densely populated area of the US. So the size of population is obviously not giving us a, an, an answer uh, to um, the, the spread of the virus. In fact, in the scientific literature, there is no evidence which suggests that density per se correlates to higher virus transmission, surprisingly and against common sense. It's more on connectivity, but also other aspects, for example, the social spatial structure of cities, access to health care, poverty, homelessness, but which determine the fatal spread of this virus. So we have to think anew, as I said, on certain issues which we know before, uh, that the, the virus was just making it much more clear to us. Cities can manage such, this crisis, is my, my, my conviction, in fact, because they ever had been in history, economic history, the hubs of resilience and innovation. So we probably have not to move from density to, or from, from uh, urban areas to rural settings, but that's, that will need some conscious policy choice, particularly with respect to inequalities, local capabilities, and the way we design our recovery. As I say, said before, the pandemic has not really created the problems we face in cities. It has just sharply exposed, and to some extent also deepened, uh, the existing structural, social, and e economic inequalities in cities. Tell me where you live, and I tell you what is your rate of infection and death. We can, this, this is a, a question we can pose, and it's especially true. It's especially true for, for people uh, without a permanent home, but homelessness 
gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, is not just a particular vulnerability to the homeless people. That's the way we usually think about it. But a home is also the first line of defense against the spread of a virus. A home is a public good in some sense. It saves us from more cases. Lockdowns and social or, or better physical distance is difficult to maintain without a place to live or living in a cramped housing condition. The same can be said for urban health care and public open spaces. The city basically has everything to withstand the pandemic, but we need to rethink the way we how we can consistently plan community health in future. The corona resilient city actually would look idly like this. Every apartment has a balcony or a terrace, flexible rooms for work, fast internet, public green spaces with walking distance, short distance to shopping or to the doctor, and common rooms that can be used in consultation with the neighborhood, whether for childcare, quarantine, or emergencies such as domestic violence. That's actually not my quote. It's a quote from the Wuppertal Institute thinking about the Corona city. But basically, it reminds me of Leipzig, and this is an opportunity to show you a little about my hometown. This is Leipzig, and in some sense, it's a medium city not too far from here, about 140 kilometers to go. Um, and it, it's in some sense, and this is my home, in fact, there <laughs> on the right side, so it's uh, my own photograph, if I may. Um, and in some sense, we have most of this kind of ed, uh, qualities of small, medium-sized cities to, who, so that could fulfill that, but we don't have this on an equal basis in every city around the world which, where we need this to face to stand up to the pandemic. It's easy to stand up to the pandemic in Leipzig, but it's difficult to stand up uh, in other cities, let's say, uh, Calcutta. At the same time, uh, we must uh, rethink in some sense and not just continue the way, but I uh, will deal with exactly that. When I came here this morning, I remember we had a kind of side talk, and that's what I appreciate to be again at a physical meeting, to have this kind of unexpected side talks. Uh, how much uh, do we face a kind of a new dynamic with, uh, with the relationship to cities and the urban environment? And I, as I said, I believe in cities, but I, I will carefully take from here that we need to observe a kind of uh, new uh, suburban and rural, rural living act, uh, attractivity within the reach of cities, obviously. So, uh, and I see in response to the perceived concentration of risk in cities, a lot of people rethink whether they live in cities or whether they li re live in uh, urban or suburban environments towards the city. So this is something we need to observe, though we are strong believers in the city. COVID-19 has highlighted the crucial role of local authorities. On the front line, in fact, of crisis management, and I guess nobody did expect this, them to be at, on the front line of crisis management. Well, uh, they serve some local purposes, but uh, they are not. Okay, I'm, I'm hurry up. So we hadn't expected them in crisis management. The, take, the measures taken by local authorities had been essential, uh, and in many cases pioneering all the efforts at higher level. I just give you here on this slide the example of introduction of compulsory use of masks in public transports. Actually, it were cities that drove what is now the new normal. It was Jena in, uh, in my area, uh, it was uh, Potsdam in the Brandenburg area who initiated the step to introduce masks in public transport while at super local level it was still disputed as a measure at all. So that's a, a good example of uh, 
cities on the front line of crisis management. Well, uh, meanwhile, the cities are running out of money. The, uh, they have significantly reduced revenues from uh, restrict, an end restricted budget because of closing down of local tax paying businesses. Shrinking local government revenues actually jeopardizes currently urban infrastructure planning and I, I guess new normal it is to be for the years to come. Uh, and we need to address the needs of uh, uh, cities. In Germany, the national government stimulus package, which I observed carefully, uh, which is about 130 billion U uh, uh, euros, include at least uh, 25 billion euros allocated to the support of municipalities, including 8 Euro, Euro, billion euros to compensate for declining local business taxes, a good first step on how to contribute to maintain essential local capabilities and strengthen local resilience and prevent setbacks also in climate protection. So to the last and final crucial question, gray or green recovery. The corona crisis cannot contribute to climate protection. It's an ill belief that we could save our climate by uh, continuing uh, a lockdown over a long-term period. There is a lot of uh, studies out there. I, I, I'm going to keep it short. The best is uh, in a new nature publication of Foster, who just, uh, uh, say, uh, who, who just analyzed the effect of a continued lockdown. It's just 0.01 degrees of Celsius that is changed through the lockdown. While at the same time, if we are now clever, and we need to be clever, green reconstruction programs can prevent a warming of 0.3 degrees Celsius, so 30 times more effective to wisely invest in green recovery than to hope on a continued lockdown. So this kind of green re restructuring programs will be decisive for also for the climate crisis to come. Chances are currently good. Uh, yes, uh, because we, we see a move away from demand stimulation that dominated in the past during, for example, the financial crisis towards investment stimulation in most national economic stimulus programs. Green uh, infrastructure is uh, at least renewable energy infrastructure is cheap uh, compared to fossil fuels. And it's undisputed among experts that uh, green infrastructure spending is significantly more employment promoting in the long term than general gray infrastructures. Let me take a, finally a look at the EU Green Growth Program. In fact, it's a program that consists of, out of the Green Deal that was decided earlier as a new strategy of the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the new EU Commission under Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, but it, is, it must be seen in conjunction with um, the decision of the EU Council of 21st of July, who, which adopted uh, a model combining economic stimulus in the corona crisis that's about 750 billion of euros, uh, unprecedented in economic history, uh, and uh, with the world's largest green investment program for the future, the EU Green Deal, which is around a trillion euro. Again, uh, uh, scale-wise, unprecedented in history. The green growth program of the EU can be seen as by far the most positive contribution towards green recovery worldwide. Uh, there is a group, in fact, uh, we are involved in this group, uh, to, to evaluate such stimulus programs. And um, as you can see uh, very clearly from the graph, on the very right-hand side is the Co European Commission. On the very left-hand side is China, surprisingly, doing worst, in fact, in terms of a green recovery. Uh, so this is kind of a ranking of uh, recovery programs by na national recovery programs by their contribution towards green recovery and the EU Commission in its combined green growth approach stands out. But a good example will not be enough in my view 
because we must understand uh, that countries like uh, in Indonesia, India, South uh, Africa, uh, which are so in the middle field, so to speak, but uh, below what we may call to be green, so they're mostly on the red side, uh, face a very specific uh, economic situation. The private capital market currently demands high risk premiums on investment exactly for those countries because of the corona up and down. It's not because of the national situation, it's about the, the sum of their national situation and the corona uncertainties. So we need favorable loans from intergovernmental development banks, possibly combined with the introduction of CO2 pricing system in those countries which could help. So the second priority next to healthy cities, in my view, is a globally inclusive green recovery after the lockdown. It means green finance for developing and emerging countries. The promise of 100 billion US dollar from the Paris Agreement on an annual basis must not be forgotten during the corona crisis, and it seems to be forgotten at the moment. Uh, we must ensure that the national funds are getting uh, to that level, and we must uh, assure that they go get to where they are mostly needed, that is, means at cities and municipalities. Thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, if, if corona uh, allows, or if uh, the new normal allows, uh, I'd like to invite you to visit Leipzig to see how a city can become pandemic re resilient. Thank you very much.